Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Holy Spirit and Spirituality. And this particular lesson, lesson number five for February 4 of 2017, is the baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit. That sounds like an interesting subject. Before we jump in, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the ways in which you bless us. And now as we consider once again the role of the Holy Spirit and what he might be able to do in our own lives, may we be honored to talk about it and share it with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, just to give us an introduction, we're going to discuss in this lesson the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how that might affect our individual lives, the prerequisites required to receive the Holy Spirit, and the difference that the infilling of the Holy Spirit might make in the life of an individual believer. That's just a clue. So let's start with John 10. Can I verse, ask a basic question yeah. first? Infilling is not something something that's in the general English vocabulary. Can yes. you put that into English words? Okay, that means to fill something. It means, you. here it is, you have it and you fill it with something. So that's... So it's the filling of the person with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Okay, okay. so John 10 verse 10. Let's look at that really quick. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that they might have life, life in all its fullness. Well, I expand the text here a bit. So, what do you think Jesus had in mind when he said that we may have life and have it to its full, the New English Bible says, New English Version, uh, I'm sorry, the New International Version, or in some translations, more abundantly, which is the more familiar King James Version. Um, Look at what John the Baptist had to say about this subject in Mark 1, and compare that, we'll look at that and compare it to some other places. Mark 1, 8 says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and Mark, and Matthew three eleven says, I baptize you with water to show that you have repented, but the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, and I am not good enough even to carry his sandals. Luke 3.16 says, So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I'm not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And finally, in the Gospel of John, I still do not know that he was the one, but God who sent me to baptize with water had said to me, You will see the Spirit come down and stay on a man. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So, of course, this is talking about the time when Jesus came to the Jordan River from his home in Nazareth to be baptized by John. Now, do we know whether Jesus and John had worked this all out in advance? Was there some kind of collusion going on here? It doesn't sound like it because he was told how to recognize Jesus. Yeah. So the Bible doesn't talk about it. But I think Ellen White says that they specifically did not have contact. God made sure they did not have contact so that when they came together, uh, there would be no, one for, no way for someone to say, well, they sort of worked this out in advance. So we have that information. So John saw Jesus approaching at the River Jordan. He stated clearly that while he baptized with water, Jesus would baptize his followers with the Holy Spirit and fire. But before that experience can happen, what are the prerequisites? Prerequisites? Well, why do you think there is a difference between John the Baptist baptizing with water as opposed to the Holy Spirit baptizing with fire? Why, why is fire? Why water? Well, I was going to discuss that a little bit later, uh, but that's fine. What do we know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with fire in Scripture anywhere? Well, tongues of fire, symbolically. Okay. Yeah. And what was the result? 
oh, speaking in tongues. And gifts. Pentecost. But that's another, that's another um, symbol, though. So what does that yeah. symbol mean? The tongues well, of fire. Well, I mean, the, the question, I guess, would be, what happened? Pentecost. Yeah, this thousands, was Pentecost. Thousands, thousands of people. Yeah, 3,000 people were baptized in one day, and the disciples went forth from there. Ellen White says, and actually apostles, they went forth from that experience. They could speak any language where they traveled clearly and distinctly, the local language. But you don't know why they used fire. Well, you could look, if you look at baptism uh, with water, it symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection uh, to newness of life. So there's a death to self, there's a resurrection to newness of life. With the fire, it's a, it usually speaks of it as, as a purification process. Uh, there's a text in 1 Corinthians 3 where it talks about uh, yet they'll be saved through fire. You know, that the, the day, the day of judgment, will test the, uh, the uh, work of each man, and mm -hmm. if it remains, he will receive a reward. If uh, it doesn't, if it's consumed, then he will be saved, but as through fire. So there's a process of refining, I think. Okay. So one okay. is the death, burial, and resurrection. The other is the refining process. It's interesting to notice this, which we don't often connect with, with uh, Pentecost, but we probably should. Peter is, has been to, Cor you, know, you know the story of Peter going to the house of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, obviously a Gentile, and Jesus was, I mean, Peter was led up there by those people who came, and he saw that vision of the sheet coming down and all that. He gets to the house of Cornelius, and he talks to the people there, and something happens. And Peter, in reporting it back to the people in Jerusalem, says in Acts eleven sixteen, Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptizes water, but you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to try to stop God? So whatever happened to them at Pentecost, apparently also happened to Cornelius and his family and his friends at, you know, Caesarea Maritime. Um, and God apparently intended for that to be something that could happen pretty regularly for people. Um, I don't know if that helps to answer your question. You thinking that maybe he saw fire there, you think? Well, if at Pentecost little flames of fire came down on the disciples, I don't know. I think the little flames of fire is not as important as how it impacted <laughs> the disciples. I mean, think what it changed in them. You know, a few weeks later, Peter's marching up to the, you know, he's arrested and then he, he appears before the Sanhedrin and he says, you are the ones who killed the Messiah. And, I mean, and this is the same Peter who, when a woman a maid pointed a finger at him at the crucifixion. He's, oh no, not me! I don't even know this guy. So there's some real changes that took place here, and I, I think that's mm. at least a significant part of this. Yeah, there were several times in the Old Testament, especially where God was represented as fire, like mm -hmm. at the burning bush, mm -hmm. the encounter with Moses. <clears throat> um, Elijah was looking for through the wind, the fire, the earthquake, and and there was a still small voice instead of the fire. So um, here's, here's what Peter said, uh, or what, uh, yeah, Peter in his sermon, you have shown me the paths that lead to life and your presence will fill me with joy. My fellow Israelites, I must speak to you plainly about our famous ancestor, King David. He died and was buried and his grave is here with us to this very day. He was a prophet and he knew what God had promised him. God had made a vow that he would make one of David's descendants a king just as David was. David saw what God was going to do in the future, and so he spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah when he said he was not abandoned in the world of the dead, his body did not rot in the grave. So when we say that, what are we, what are we implying? Was it mem mem remember the Jews said, four days, that's the key. If you're in the grave four days, it's all over. So 
God has raised this very Jesus from death, and we are all witnesses to this fact. He has been raised to the right-hand side of God, his Father, and has received from him the Holy Spirit as he had promised. What you <coughs> now see and hear is his gift that he has poured out on us. For it was not David who went up into heaven, rather. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right until I put your enemies as a footstool under your feet. All the people of Israel then are to know for sure that this Jesus, whom you crucified, is the one that God has made Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were deeply troubled and said to Peter and the other apostles, What shall we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven. And you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit, for God's promise was made to you and your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So Peter was pretty forthright about um, what happened there. Um, so, is that a once-in-a-lifetime once kind of experience? Well, that's what I was saying about the difference between the baptism with water and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Baptism with water, you should die every day, but you're not going to go through that process every mm -hmm. day. But you can come to God anywhere, anytime, and get that renewing which should happen every day, or yes. several times a day. Okay. So every day as we study our Bibles, we pray. When we have our opportunity, we witness to others. We are really asking the Holy Spirit to come into our lives, into our minds, into our thoughts, and make the necessary changes so that we can become like Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. In the same way all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. Now, what's he talking about when he says the one Spirit to drink? Well, you drink something that's liquid, and we speak. Jesus spoke of the water of life, and mm -hmm. there should be a well of water springing up and, and into unto everlasting life, uh, although you tend to drink something from the outside in as opposed to mm -hmm. internally, but it might be referring to something like that. It's interesting if you go back a couple of chapters there, um, in 1 Corinthians 10, he said, I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. So here's the baptism again. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. So this isn't the first time it's talking about drinking some member of the Godhead. He's already talked about drink, eating and drinking Jesus. As a, the quotation I, uh, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of water, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So there is that connection. There. Mm -hmm. do, we, do we know of people? Do we have personal experiences in which we, um, we know we have been filled with the Spirit. We've had something happen to us that clearly says God was present. Um, and other times when we know clearly that God wasn't present in our lives. That's not an impossible question. Yes, it's scary. It's mm -hmm. scary. That's, that's true. That's true. I don't know how many of you had the privilege of, of reading this book and this isn't a necessarily an advertisement, but it's, it's an example. There is a book recently published entitled One Miracle After Another. And this guy, from the time he was a young kid, right through his life, grew up in, in Eastern Europe, in Romania, and finally ended up coming to this country and being a pastor. But it is just unbelievable, the experiences that happened to this man. And clearly, you know, there's no way these things could have happened like that without God's intervention almost every step of the way. So, well, some other verses. We have lots of verses in this study. 
Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Um, Acts 13.52, The believers in Antioch were full of joy and the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and 9, but you do not live as your human nature tells you to. Instead, you live as the Spirit tells you to, if in fact God's Spirit lives in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So, there's some more references to having the Spirit in us. Um, what does that mean? Is, is the Holy Spirit sort of, you know, Jesus in His prayer in his final prayer there in John 17 says, I and you and you and me and I'm with the Father and you know, you just sort of get twisted up about who's and who there. Is this making that story even more complicated or what's going on here? Well, we're either filled with ourselves or with the Spirit. Okay. Uh, we can be swept clean and put in order as in Jesus' parable, but uh, then other clean, unclean spirits will come in. If mm -hmm. we're empty, if we'll, uh, our, the end state will be worse than the, the beginning. So we need to be filled with something, and uh, God wants us to be filled with the Spirit. So we have this, this um, in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness may be of, of God, not of ourselves. Okay. So basically what we're talking about here that is that what it would be like to have a person so focused on the life of Jesus that his walk, his talk, his thoughts reflect the experience of Jesus Christ. Could that happen in our day? That goes back to life and more abundantly. Yeah, exactly. Life to its full. Well, I, I have one issue with... Uh, how we look at that text, and some seem to use it more as a, um, a, a prosperity gospel kind of mm -hmm. thing, you know, or uh, an excuse for self-indulgence. Um, but uh, there's different words for life in Greek, just as there are for love, and uh, like bios, which is life, plants, mm -hmm. animals, everything. Um, another one is suke which we also translate as soul, and there's mm -hmm. also zoe. Mm -hmm. uh, Fine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says, speaking generally, suki is the individual life, the living being, whereas zoe is the life of that being, so more like the force or the, mm -hmm. the power to live as opposed to the experience. So people tend to, to translate that as if it were the experience of life, uh, but the word is zoe, which is the power of life, which is mm -hmm. we, where uh, it's also used uh, in speaking of uh, life eternal. When it talks about, uh, uses suke, in fact, in the next couple of verses, it says, I, I lay my, uh, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his sheep. And the word is suke there. So, uh, or he who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who seeks to lose his life for my sake will, will save it unto eternal life. So this experience of life we lay down, but he gives us the power to live. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a difference uh, if we look at it. What, one of the big challenges maybe for us to think about is what's the relationship between receiving the Holy Spirit and having faith? <coughs> let, me, let me point a couple of verses. Look at Galatians 3 verse 2. Tell me this one thing. This is Galatians 3, 2. Tell me this one thing. Did you receive God's Spirit by doing what the law required or by hearing the gospel and believing it? Believing, having faith, trusting, being con convinced. Those are all the same words. And verse 14 in that same chapter, Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Christ Jesus so that through faith we might receive the Spirit promised by God. Through faith, we might receive the Spirit promised by God. Is yeah, that a clue? Trust Him if we're gonna if we're gonna die to self, which is what it takes. We have to trust Him with our life, mm -hmm. and that's that's where faith uh, comes in there. The trust, the faith, 
so that uh, we can turn our lives over to God and allow His Spirit to guide us rather than the flesh. Mm -hmm. But our lesson points out that having a, an experience once, maybe at the time of baptism or maybe some future time, having even a great emotional experience. You, go, you attend a series of meetings or something and you're all excited and it seems great at that moment. Having that experience once isn't enough to last a lifetime. You need to, that, this needs to be an ongoing experience, an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's where daily Bible study and prayer come in. Yes. Well, many Christian evangelists and pastors suggest that if they, had, if they could just have more of the power of the Holy Spirit, they would accomplish great things. I remember some time back, one evangelist, one Christian evangelist, I don't think he's with us anymore, said, one of these days I'm going to I'm going to have a live resurrection on television, and then I'll convert the world. See? I'll, I'll, I'll. Mm-hmm. But being filled with the Holy Spirit may have a different meaning. Is it that we are supposed to possess more of Him or that He is supposed to possess more of us? <laughs> I think the answer to that should be obvious, right? <laughs> Ellen White said these words, I wish to impress upon you the fact that those who have Jesus abiding in the heart by faith have actually received the Holy Spirit. Every individual who receives Jesus as his personal Savior just as surely receives the Holy Spirit to be his counselor, sanctifier, guide, and witness. Manuscript releases, volume 14, page 71. One thing I think is quite certain, the Holy Spirit cannot fill the lives of those who are filled with the thoughts of their own sins. Repentance and baptism are supposed to clear away this rubbish from our lives. Is that easy to do? Did I hear a resounding no somewhere? No. <laughs> it's well, not easy to not do. Easy. Yeah, it's, it, it takes trust. It takes great faith and trust. I thought of a question mm -hmm. last Sabbath in Sabbath school. I wanted to ask, and I know that you have talked about it before, but I was thinking of Satan, and we were talking about the devil and Job and different things. And Does Satan and his angels or Lucifer when he was in heaven, do, whether it's Lucifer and his angels or any of the angels, do they have the ability, as humans do, to contract viruses or become ill? That's a good question. Probably not. Well, I would think not, too, but I thought, you know, as humans, when we encounter some life-threatening something or other, it kind of does that jolt and go, okay, I'm not in control. Mm -hmm. Did the devil never have that experience? Because he, seemed to th he still seems to think he can be in control. Yeah. I would have thought with all the times he's been defeated by Jesus Christ, he would have sort of gotten the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he hasn't quite got a clear picture of that yet. <laughs> yeah, it's craziness. Anyway. I don't know how you can describe it any other way. Yeah. I was just looking at the first part of that question there. I think that would be Satan's delight to have us so absorbed. We're looking at our own sins. We haven't got time to let our lives be filled with something better. Yeah. And we can have our lives filled even with good things. Mm -hmm. Satan would love to have us just be so occupied with doing good deeds that we don't have the time to really get to know Jesus, get to have this real experience. Um, I, I'm afraid that there's going to be people, I can think of times when I, people I think I've known in the past, were so busy doing all those good things in the church and they were just night and day doing this and that and the other and, and yet you wondered what kind of an experience they actually had with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's a daily process. Does the Holy Spirit help us to recognize our need for repentance? <laughs> well, he brings us Jesus, and it, you'll have a quote later on somewhere about the closer we get to Christ, the yeah. more uh, sinful we appear in our own eyes. So, yeah. so there is that, uh, Are we, our need of repentance. Yeah. Does he just make us sorry for the consequences of our sins, 
or could we actually reach a place where we're sorry about the sin itself? Is that easy? Well, as we know Christ, then, then we see what it cost that should make us sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, if we indeed have begun the life of faith and are following him, uh, then we will uh, come to see things more as he sees them and less mm -hmm. in terms of the world. Do, go ahead, someone was say, I was say, do we really believe that following Jesus is the more abundant life? Do, people, do Christians generally think, okay, if I'm doing everything I'm supposed to and I'm avoiding all the sinful pleasures, now this is really enjoying life? Or do we think, well, how many Christians think, well, you know, just a little bit of the world's sinful pleasures. You know, I can't give up all of that. I mean, what does God expect of me, really? Have you ever sort we, of... Go ahead. Is it because we don't really know what that's like? I mean, what it, what it would be like. You hear stories of people who, who live an exciting Christian life. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this word abundantly has intrigued me because um, there's something in it that says, you know, I'd, I'd like to experience that. I'd like to know what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you have to think there's more than what we live what we're living now, like there's more to life. We we were intended for a lot more than this. Yeah. And uh, but living a life in Christ has got to be like your your man that you were talking about in the book. It's got to be exciting, mm -hmm. you know. And it was it's a whole different level, a whole other level. I was going to suggest that that uh, this is part of. Of, of when you recognize sin and not feel sorry for just that there were consequences, but that you sinned. Isn't that a process of sanctification? Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't, isn't that an education that we get over time? We're learning, yeah. okay, I did that. I don't want to do that again. Lord, you know, let's not <laughs> go there again. Um, but you learn. You learn uh, what not to do, and you learn experience this life in Christ, it's got to be exciting. I, in Philippians, Paul obviously is convinced that this is, a, you know, he says, uh, uh, according to the flesh, I have all these benefits, all these great things, but he counts them all as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. So that's his testimony that, uh, that Jesus is Worth everything, and, and, and this is a, this is the Paul that says, "I've had been in shipwrecks. I've been beaten to, to, to within a breadth of my an inch of my death, by not only by Jews but by Romans and all those." I mean, First Corinthians eleven. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians eleven. It's just Full incredible the stuff he went through, and he still thinks it's great. Yeah, he uh, mentions even the fellowship of his sufferings. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think that's an abundant life. Well, but he it, thought it was all come the trials and troubles. No, but come back to what I was saying about what the abundant life is. It's not the experience of life; it's the power to live. So mm -hmm. he gives us power in those situations to live where others would be crushed. Power to live like Jesus wants us to live, like right. his intention for us to live is. All the trials come as a result of sin, and, and the man who has not learned what that's all about. So when somebody, when you're being whipped by your foe with lashes, are you saying that you feel good even during that time? That Doesn't, um, You don't have to feel good, but you can see it as va valuable because you're... Uh, willing, you know, you, you're suffering for his sake. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at the sure. the, the, the testimony of the apostles, you're not enjoying it, certainly. Well, I thought that's what we were talking about, enjoying. No. Okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> let, let, let me let, let me talk about the other side of it. I've had the experience in my life of working with some people who knew nothing at all about the church when I met them, and 
they you know, I said a few things and started discussing. They said, well, tell me more about this, tell me more about that. And to, to watch somebody, work with somebody, and watch them come right through the process and finally decide to join the church on their own, even without my asking them, just because of what they had learned, that's exciting. Is. That is very exciting. And I would call that the life more abundant. Well... When speaking to his disciples, Jesus told them very directly that to receive the blessings that God offered, they and we must be persistent in asking. Why do you think God wants us to be persistent in asking? You know the verse that says, you know, you must ask, you must seek, you must knock. The judge that wouldn't give mm -hmm. uh, the person, the lady has her rights, so she kept coming and coming uh, and asking for is God not sure that we really mean it the first time, or what's the problem there? No, I think I think when you do that, you understand the will. <coughs> I mean, you understand what the will is, and um, it's just that decision process that mm -hmm. you keep that decision going. And it's not necessarily that you you're running the extra mile by asking so much. It's just that. Is the point is that you've decided and you're you're continually deciding as you're doing that repeatedly you're mm -hmm. reinforcing your decision right mm -hmm. yeah. look at Acts 532 we are witnesses to these things we and the Holy Spirit who is God's gift to those who obey him what does that mean God's gift to those who obey him Obedience in the biblical sense requires several steps in the process. First of all, we need to understand clearly that God wants to teach us something. Then we must give our full and willing consent to following Him. Then with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we must progress as far as possible in actually doing God's will. Now I need to throw in something here that some of us have talked about in the past. The Greek word used in the New Testament for obedience is hupakoe. That's a long, funny-sounding word. It means listening under. It means a humble willingness to listen. You may not be able to do a lot. You may do your very best, and it may not be very much, but you're willing. That goes with what Gary just said, you know. Keep asking that. That tells the Lord, yes, I'm, I'm really serious about this. What about the thief on the cross? What was he able to do? Hang there and die, right? Express his faith in Jesus. Yeah. Look how many people he's yeah. reached with his What he was able example. to do was change his attitude. Mm -hmm. Change his attitude about Jesus next to him and uh, God in general. You know, I, I, mean, I, I always think about the word obey. I think it's kind of changed its meaning since even when Ellen White used it. Mm -hmm. That now it seems like it's 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 a to obey is to be forced to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it kind of feels like now. But I don't think it's been like that. I think it's been what you said. You know, the, mm -hmm. the willingness to listen mm -hmm. and to respond to the listening. What do you think of First John? This is First John two verses four and five. I need a comment on the last word you're talking about. Yeah, I was reading the Spirit of Prophecy where. Um, when we get immersed in God's will for us every day, pretty soon we are not doing what we want to do is the same thing that God would have us do. Mm -hmm. It just transforms us. Mm -hmm. So we actually want to do that, but that's what Christ would probably have us do anyway. Very anyway. good. First John 2, verses 4 and 5. Those who say that they know Him, would that be all Christians? Probably so but do not obey his commands are liars and there is no truth in them. Whoa! <laughs> All those who obey his word are people whose love for God has really been made perfect. This is how we can be sure that we are in union with God. Does God um, mm. call us liars? Well, in the next verse it says, when the one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same way as he walked. And he, mm -hmm. he 
came to do the will of the Father and all the way to the end, nevertheless, not my will be, be done, but thine will. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was always referencing the Father to seek to do his will. Mm -hmm. And that's really what, uh, what we should be doing as well. Mm -hmm. And we come to know that through Jesus. Another couple of verses that talk about the contrast be doing, between doing our will and God's will, uh, Jude, a little tiny book just before Revelation, verses 18 and 19. They said to you, when the last days come, people will appear who will mock you, people who follow their own godless desires. These are the people who cause divisions, who are controlled by their natural desires, who do not have the Spirit. So it's contrasting once again, having the Spirit and being controlled by your own desires. The presence of God, we talked about a little bit about this before, the presence of God is often described in the Bible as being something like fire or flames. Does that apply to the Holy Spirit? Does that, I mean, I, really the question is, would that be appropriate for all members of the Godhead? Can you think of some times when God appeared as fire? Burning bush. The burning bush, okay. Any more? Any other times? Oh, wow. On Mount Carmel. Mount, Pardon me, yeah. on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Do we know who was up there? All three members of the Godhead. All three members of the Godhead were up on that mountain, Ellen White says. Also the cloud by day and the pillar of fire yeah. by night. Yeah. Fire the tabernacle. And First Corinthians 10 says that was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the the fire of God's presence that went into the uh, wilderness sanctuary, mm -hmm. wilderness uh, tent, mm -hmm. as well as into Solomon. Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so we're now talking about some kind of powerful force that's represented by fire in contrast to our natural human desires. And we need, to, we, we need to be honest here. The battle against self is never an easy one. We love to be in charge. We want to be able to do what we want to do. But that is Satan's way. The battle against self is probably the greatest battle of all time. But if we succeed in recognizing the advantages of having the Holy Spirit in our lives, then, and here's Ellen White's words in the Zarb Ages, page 250 and 251, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who, by putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. What do you suppose it would mean? No limit to the usefulness. Does that mean in the hands of God, presumably? Mm -hmm. That's living life to the fullest. Yeah. Okay. More abundantly. Uh, I don't have time to read it right now, but Galatians 5, we've looked at several times. It's interesting to look at, well, we'll, we'll do that in a moment. Let's look at this first. Uh, Ephesians 5, let's look especially at 17 to 20. Don't be fools then, by tr but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. Do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and praises to the Lord with praise in your hearts. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks to, for everything to God the Father. So, in our Bible study guide, we have this chart. Um, on Thursday, February 2 of 2017, there's a self-centered person in contrast to the spirit-controlled person. The self-centered person desires what is sinful and, desire, and is pleasing to God. The spirit-controlled person desires what is spiritual and pleasing to God. The self-centered person is controlled by sinful passions. The spirit-controlled person is controlled, obviously, by the spirit. The selfish person misuses his or her freedom and gets enslaved in sin. The spirit-filled person is set free from the bondage of sin and is called to freedom in Christ. The self-centered person is disobedient to God's will. The, the spirit-controlled person is obedient to God's will. The self-indulgent or self-centered person is self-indulgent. The spirit-controlled person is self-sacrificing. The self-centered person displays the fruit of sin. 
the spirit-controlled person displays the fruit of the spirit. And finally, the self-centered person does not recognize the need for forgiveness and is boastful of self. The spirit-filled person recognizes the need for forgiveness and praises Jesus for what he has done. That's a pretty incredible list of contrasts, isn't it? Hmm. Let's not deceive ourselves. We cannot transform ourselves. We do not have the power to do that because sin is so ingrained in our lives. There is no... This is no mere external change. It requires a complete change in our thoughts and our minds, including our motives. It is the work of a lifetime. God recognizes that there will be ups and downs. God is not saying this is just going to be a nice, easy, smooth climb to heaven. But he promises to work with us if we truly ask him to do so. And as Gary suggested, maybe we need to keep asking. Can you identify times in your life when you truly have been guided by the Holy Spirit as well as times when you have been determined to do your own thing? I'm not asking anyone to answer that question out loud. Uh, we'll, wars against the flesh. We'll throw that to the audience out there. Yeah. Think about your own experience. Well, there are many times when we can recount being guided by our own desires. Mm -hmm. How many times can we think of being guided by the Holy Spirit? Yeah. What happens if you, if things actually work out that your desires are, are God's desires, mm -hmm. then how are you going to split, find well, a difference? Uh, Ellen White makes it very clear that if we, we can eventually come to the place that when, when doing God's will, we're only carrying out our own desires. That's, that's where it's supposed to come to, yes. Well, I, if you get to that point, and if Gordon says that, I'm still going to be kind of wondering about myself. <laughs> well, we have the feedback <laughs> me mechanism of, of the law that tells mm -hmm. us whether mm -hmm. we indeed are walking after the Spirit. Uh, because there are those who would say, well, all you need is the Spirit. And uh, we'll be getting more into the law in a little bit mm -hmm. here. But, mm -hmm. but the law gives us another point of reference mm -hmm. the, to tell us whether we indeed are walking after the Spirit or if we're wandering off some other way. Jesus said, you know, thy law, what is it, thy laws, uh, um, I delight to do thy yeah. will, oh, oh my God, thy law is within my heart. So yeah. that would be kind of that experience, because mm -hmm. his law is in we, our we, heart. Yeah. We can ask the question, how often do we ask the Lord, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, to be active in something? And then, when we ask and we have faith that the Lord will, in some way, take part in that, mm -hmm. then we have an answer that the Lord, there have been a lot of times in our lives, maybe we just don't know it. Mm -hmm. So, now let, let's talk about this. What form does self-control take? Okay. Remember, Galatians 5.23, the, the last part of that, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So what? how does that manifest itself? We choose to walk after the flesh or after the Spirit. That's the control that we have. Okay. Beyond that, we're either controlled then by our lusts or we're controlled, in a sense, by the Spirit. There's a couple, two or three things we can say for sure. God never forces himself on us. But he asks us to voluntarily allow the Holy Spirit to work with us. In fact, God suggests that to be truly free, we need to have this working relationship with the Holy Spirit. So how does that make us truly free? Well, if we mm -hmm. walk after the Spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. We will uh, free, mm -hmm. what is it, Galatians 8. I mean Romans 8, that mm -hmm. uh, the law of sin and death, who will set me free, free from the, the law of sin and death that is working in Ro my members? Romans 7, members, 25, yeah. I think it but is. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law yeah. of sin and death. Mm -hmm. or Romans 8, 2. Quite a number of places in the Bible. Psalm 119, 45, Luke 4, 18, John 8, 34 to 36. That's close to where you were talking about. 2 Corinthians 3.17, Galatians 5.1, a bunch of places. 
God is trying to make it clear that the only real freedom comes when we recognize that His way is the only right way. There is no other way to live eternally. And so Ellen White comments, the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. Desire of Ages 172, paragraph 1, and a number of other places. Well, the Greek word often translated blessed also means happy. Is a spirit-filled life really the happiest life? Can we personally testify to that? Paul and Silas were in prison and they had been beaten and they were uncomfortable, certainly, but they were singing praises to God. So there was something within them welling up unto eternal life that was... I wonder... Had a joy that surpasses yeah. feeling good, you know, in the fleshly sense. The, there are those who claim they understand what those Roman, Roman prisons were like. They said that often you're almost like in a crucifixion kind of a position, sometimes at about 45 degrees instead of vertical, and you're, you're, you're chained to a rock. How do you sleep? I don't know whether they were singing just because they couldn't sleep when they were hurting or whether, but, but certainly, I mean, think of they, they you know, the, the people of the world in that position would be cursing and swearing, wouldn't they be? And here's Paul and Silas singing. Well, would we dare to sing if it brought on an earthquake? <laughs> I'm wondering about Abraham as he's walking out with Isaac. It wasn't a physical pain it was an emotional but he had to have faith that what he was doing was what God wanted him to do yeah I, I can't imagine that but. talking about talking about um, people who, who claim or either have or have claimed to have the Holy Spirit there are large groups of people who call themselves Christians who say to really have the Holy Spirit you have to be able to speak in tongues what do you say to those people? I've heard some <coughs> uh, comments by people that uh, have been involved with those, and if, if you don't end up uh, speaking in tongues, then they then they use it as a put down that you're not uh, as, and then pretty soon those those people are, are gone off the deep end to some other direction. My so. my favorite story about that is uh, when back in 1972. This is a long time ago now. The Full, businessmen, full Gospel Businessmen's Association said, we're going to pray for the Seventh-day Adventist Church this whole year so that they can get the Spirit. They can really be baptized by the Spirit and they can speak in tongues. So there was a meeting held and they invited a lot of Adventists so they tried to, I don't know how many actually went, to a meeting in downtown Boston. So this one teacher went down there to this meeting and, and so pretty soon you know, they started and people standing up and you know, speaking their, their t in their tongues and so forth. And so finally this guy stood up and he went off, da -da 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 all this kind of stuff. And he, after a little bit, he sat down and oh, they were all excited. This guy across the room jumped up and he says, oh, the brother has just brought us a message from the Lord. And he started expounding on what he said and so forth. Oh, thank you, brother, and so forth. And when he was done, the, the Adventist teacher stood up and says, he says, I got a problem here. He says, I just quoted Isaiah 53 from the Hebrew, and I don't know how that <laughs> has any relationship to what, what this guy just said. And the whole building just went, the whole place went. <laughs> Maybe it was a different spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. Well, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit working with and through angels. How does that work out? How, how, how does that take place? Do we see that happening? We, we know how the Holy Spirit worked through angels in inspiring prophets to write portions of Scripture. Does the Holy Spirit still work through angels in our day? Mm -hmm. What could happen? The 
angels might be working through the Holy Spirit more than we think they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Certainly worked with Ellen White. Yeah. She had her how do we how do we recognize more fully the dangers of sin in our excuse me sin in our own lives? Is there is there a way to study the Bible to ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit to help us better to recognize our own problems? You can put away all that weakens our faith and seek mm -hmm. after all those things that will mm -hmm. grow and strengthen our faith. Is there any indication in the Bible anywhere that God's reluctant to give us the Holy Spirit? No. Not at all. He longs to give us His Holy Spirit. Well, it was never God's... Does it always come, though? What? Does it always come easy? Well, I mean, so the question is, why not? I mean, theoretically, God is waiting to give every one of us, in this room and every Christian for that matter, Theoretically, God is waiting to give His Holy Spirit to every single Christian. So why doesn't it happen? Well, He couldn't do many miracles in one place because of the lack of their faith. And I suppose it comes down to the same thing. If we don't trust God, mm -hmm. and, we, and we, we don't start off trusting anybody or even God 100%, we, we have to grow in that. Mm -hmm. But we can trust Him to the extent that we can. Probably because we're not ready to receive it. He's willing to give it to us, yeah. but if we're not willing to re ready to receive it, He's so, not going to force it upon us. The, the people who are going to receive the Holy Spirit, those would be pastors, Bible <laughs> teachers, the spiritual elite, right? God can't expect all the rest of us ordinary mortals to receive the Holy Spirit, right? Anyone who's willing. Anyone who's willing, wow. But again, that's scary. <laughs> Okay. There's one of the things that really rises in the minds of young people that we need to be aware of. There's, in fact, just let me read um, a passage here, Matthew 12, 31. And so I tell you that people can be forgiven any sin and any evil thing they say, but whoever says evil things against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who says something against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But whoever says something against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven now or ever. Wow. Hmm. And Mark 3, 29 says basically the same thing. So is, what's, the, what's with this unpardonable sin thing? Me. Dennis, no, you've got to have an answer to that. Yeah. You have to have an answer to that. I'm waiting for... <laughs> God isn't so concerned about who says stuff, but that things are said, so... Well, I've said mine several times, you have. But, but I want to hear yours. Well, just that there's... Uh, if we sin against the Spirit, if we resist the Spirit, there's no other means of salvation because it's through the Spirit that we receive Jesus and that we see the Father and... So if we're, we're resisting His Spirit, there's... Uh, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit is, is sent to bring Jesus to us. Right. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So now if He is the way, and we say, no, I don't want that way, I want to do it some other way, what happens? You've made a decision. you made, You've a, made decision. a choice. you made a choice. And God will ultimately honor your choice. Mm -hmm. right. Can you yeah. not change your mind? Oh, sure. you can change Angle your mind, buddies. but at that, at that point in time. Uh, and, and the people who have ultimately committed, if you, if you read what Ellen White says and you read in depth what others have commented about the unpardonable sin, the unpardonable part means if you finally get to the place that you have no interest, not even the slightest bit of interest in coming back to God, and God has to say, Galatians, I mean, Hosea 4, uh, 17, uh, is Ephraim is joined to idols, just let him alone. Let him go. What? It's called freedom. Yeah, it's called freedom. Well, is, is there a way to distinguish whether or not we're being led by the Holy Spirit or not? Well, the law can give us feedback. Uh, other people can give us feedback yeah. to try to turn us, you know, those who are spiritual will try to return would, someone who is caught in a trespass. Yeah. Would the Holy Spirit lead us contrary to what he said in the past in the scriptures? 
No. No. So maybe the Bible would be the best clue, right? <clears throat> and uh, just a, a few quick comments about how to read and how to understand scripture, there are three things that we need to always keep in mind. One, when you want to understand a certain passage, you need to read it in the full context. You need to understand, as far as possible, understand who's talking, to whom are they talking, why, what are the circumstances, why is he saying this? Then two, how do the words and ideas in this particular passage compare with other passages in scripture? So, if you see something said here, is it said somewhere else? What were the context in which that was said? And then finally, there are occasionally times when you need, it's helpful to be able to look up the original Greek word, or the original Hebrew word in a, a, a commentary or a, or a Bible dictionary is helpful in that to, to understand. Sometimes that throws light on what the passage actually means. Of course, that wouldn't have helped Abraham too well when he was no. told to sacrifice Isaac. No, it would not. Well, Seventh Adventists have always believed that baptism is by immersion. So if we're baptized by water in, in, in the water baptism, how are we baptized with the Spirit and fire in the Spirit's baptism? How does that work? Anybody been baptized in fire? Well, it's like what Dennis said. And there's, there's some sort of... Um, progress of purification is happening mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. Trials. And and trials, yeah. And um, sometimes sometimes I think when God presents himself as fire, he's just telling you that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm disciplined too. Mm -hmm. And well, We're running out of time here, but we have not yet talked about the latter rain. Do you think the latter rain could come with the same same degree of power that happened at Pentecost? Absolutely. It could. It could happen in our generation, huh? We really think that. I, I, I certainly believe that. I think the Holy Spirit is prepared. I mean, I lived in a part of the world where there were these early rains and there were latter rains, and the latter rains were always a lot heavier than the early rains. So, um, you know, I think that's what God intended for us to, to, to experience. The Holy Spirit's waiting. God is waiting. Now it's our move. It's time for us to say, yes, Lord, take control. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to think about some of these very important aspects that uh, we, we know are in the scripture, and yet we're not always sure exactly how we should understand them. Thank you for this time to speak with your children around the world. May they be blessed as we have been is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.